welcome to the Steroids Podcast with your host, Dan the Bodybuilder from Thailand. The Steroids Podcast is brought to you by Ultimate Guide to Roids, 109 page ebook by Dan the Bodybuilder from Thailand. Now, for the first time in bodybuilding history, you have someone with no corporate interests and no obligation to please anyone, not walking on eggshells to not offend. Ultimate Guide to Roids gives you the information, the whole information. The whole truth, not a full truth and a half truth, full truth. Ultimate Guide to Roids gives you the keys to the Lamborghini, gives you the information, and lets you decide what to do with it. It's a crime this information has been suppressed this long. Now let's get on with the podcast. All right, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Steroids Podcast. I had a few things I wanted to talk about right away. Uh, just some stuff I wanted to talk about that weren't questions, but there's uh, hormone knowledge, okay? So last uh, podcast, I talked about T4 um, upregulating the body's response to growth hormone. And people were really curious about the um, physiological explanation for that. It's very complicated. Uh, and so that's why I left the uh, explanation, like the... Uh, biological explanation for that um, pretty much unsaid in the last article, but I will elaborate on it here uh, because you guys uh, expressed interest in that. So um, the thyroid hormone and growth hormone, you know, T3 thyroid hormone and growth hormone are synergistic. Okay. Um, But when someone takes T3 thyroid hormone, um, they, they notice catabolic activity, okay? But this doesn't have to be this way, okay? And the way to get around that is by using T4, which converts to T3. Then the person notices anabolic activity rather than the uh, catabolic activity of the T3. And uh, when it's combined with the growth hormone, okay? And the reason for this is because of the growth hormone, uh, the, the growth hormone response in the body and the uh, expression of growth hormone related genes being upregulated by the conversion process of T4 to T3, okay? So when the body, uh, if you started supplementing yourself with T3, okay, active thyroid hormone, the body is going to notice that there is an excess of active thyroid hormone in the body, and then it's going to decrease the presence of the conversion enzymes that it naturally has that converts the body's natural T4 to T3, okay? And these conversion enzymes, they're called deiodinases. When those deiodinases are um, downregulated because the body has too much of the active thyroid hormone, those deiodinases are actually very important factors in the body's response to the uh, thyroid hormone um, and and what the thyroid hormone uh, does in the body uh, as well as the growth hormone. So the deiodinases have uh, effects in the pituitary gland and in the liver um, that produces um, p- peptide hormones, um, growth factors. Uh, and if you take T3, you supplement with T3, your body stops producing those um, deiodinases that are meant for converting inactive thyroid hormone to active thyroid hormone. But this doesn't happen if you take T4. So when you take T4, your body then keeps or upregulates the amount of deiodinases that it has as it converts the T4 to T3. And then that having the deiodinases present in a high quantity with the high quantity of T3 then increases your response to the growth hormone. Uh, So it's, uh, you know, those are more complex biological systems that uh, we're talking about here rather than, uh, you know, the normal steroid stuff and everything. Uh, but that's the, the basic uh, breakdown of, of, of what's happening here, okay, is uh, the 
conversion enzymes that are the thyroid conversion enzymes um, being potent and being having effects that affect the way that your body responds to thyroid hormone, affect the way that your body responds to growth hormone. Um, and then taking T3 outright uh, down regulates the amount of those uh, conversion enzymes. And so you don't want that. You need those conversion enzymes. So that's why T4, people who use it notice, wow, this is much less catabolic than T3 is. Um, and is actually anabolic um, to a degree when combined with the right other supplements. All right, uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was Anavar, uh, 100 milligrams per day. Uh, Anavar, usually when we talk about Anavar, uh, I say something like Winstrol is better. It, it does everything that Winstrol does, or it does, Winstrol does everything that Anavar does. But, when, but uh, Winstrol does it better, which is mostly true. But Anavar is a good um, muscle fullness agent or anabolic muscle builder at around 100 milligrams per day. Um, it, it has a bigger, more, it has a more roundness factor to it or volumizing factor to it than Winstrol does. Winstrol is very effective at 50 milligrams per day. Um, it's extremely effective at 100 milligrams per day. But, you know, Anavar really, it's only very minimally effective at around 50 milligrams per day. It really needs to be bumped up into that 100, mic or 100 milligram per day range to get the good effect uh, that people are looking for from Anavar. So a lot of times when people are uh, disappointed with Anavar, you know, they're using 50 milligrams of Anavar and they're like, oh, this is shit, you know. If you do bump it up to 100 milligrams, then it is a worthwhile compound to use. It's a worthy compound to use as like an experienced bodybuilder, Anavar 100 milligrams per day. Um, it's definitely potent at that dosage. I myself, uh, you could say, really enjoy using it at that dosage. Um, it, it has a pretty profound psychological influence too you know people say like oh uh, anavar doesn't have any side effects it's pretty mentally active um i notice just from talking to people who listen to the podcast who use anavar that it's very common for them to get um irritable from using anavar uh to get edgy mentally um but you know taking anavar as a pre-workout uh has you know, when you're already using it, you know, and so you're, you're on it. I mean, there's definitely some pre-workout uh, aggression effect to taking a large dose pre-workout of Anavar. Um, and I would say that it's more significant than like Winstrol, for example. Winstrol, there's not really much pre-workout aggression effect from that, but there is from taking Anavar. Um, it's pretty mentally active. And again, the uh, muscle fullness factor with Anavar, muscle roundness, 100 milligrams per day. If you guys are looking to use Anavar or you've, you've used Anavar before and you've not been impressed, um, I can vouch for 100 milligrams per day being a worthy dosage that if you use that, if you use 100 milligrams of legitimate Anavar per day, you're going to think, hey, this is, this is really good stuff. You know, this is really worthy stuff. This, this can be a tool that can really help me uh, with my my bodybuilding goals, all right? Where normally we kind of dismiss Anavar or experienced uh, steroid users, experienced bodybuilders kind of dismiss Anavar as being useless. When you bring it up to 100 milligrams per day, it's not useless anymore. Had some questions about growth hormone pre-workout and versus post-workout like growth hormone timing with workouts and, and why. So um, somebody said um, that there, there's a bodybuilding coach uh, called named JP uh, from the UK and he's good. He has good information. And um, they were saying he says to take it, you know, growth hormone pre-workout. But then on the podcast, I've normally said to take it post-workout. 
again, what I wanted to say about like timing with all this stuff is that it doesn't matter that much. The big details is that you get your PEDs in like once every 24 hours or so, fast acting PEDs. Um, the smaller details would be the timing, but you're gonna get 90% of the effects just from getting them in regularly. And then like detailed timing issues is gonna be the remaining 10% that you can you know push it to get the best effect, uh, but it's not gonna be super significant. So that goes for like your orals too. And like when, you know, when to take your orals, you know, you take 50 milligrams D-ball per day, once per day, you get 90% of the effects, you know, and if you take it instead spread out throughout the day and you know, five equal dosages of 10 milligrams, that only makes the D-ball experience, you know, roughly 10% different. You know, you're mostly, however you do it, you're pretty much gonna get the same effect more or less. Uh, so that, that's, that's with the timing in general, but with the growth hormone pre-workout versus post-workout, I'll tell you why I use it post-workout and my logic there, and also tell you why someone would use it pre-workout. Uh, so if someone is using growth hormone pre-workout, um, it does make sense from a muscle growth standpoint, um, because you could... A lot of people, a lot of people that use growth hormone are using insulin too. Okay, so when you're in your workout, it makes sense to load your blood with stuff: anabolics, growth hormones, insulin, amino acid proteins, um, glucose, because during your workout, you are pushing blood, which carries those things into the target muscle that's being worked. So if that blood is full of anabolic substances and you're directly pushing it into the muscle that's being damaged, that's pretty freaking logical that that's going to help with muscle growth. So, okay, that, that's basically, you know, the reason why, you know, if you, if you are pumping uh, blood filled with IGF-1 uh, from the growth hormone shot, during the workout into your muscle, it makes sense that that would be good for growing your muscle. Um, and then, you know, for people that also take insulin pre-workout, uh, what they're doing with that is that they are, they're taking the insulin and then they're, they're, uh, loading up like a, an intra workout drink, um, as well as pre-workout meal that has a lot of sugars and, uh, fast acting proteins in it. Usually the pre-workout meal would be something like chicken and rice or, or oatmeal and rice. And then during the workout would be something like uh, some kind of glucose dextrose drink with whey or something like that. And then again, you know, you're, you're pushing the then insulin in your blood into the muscle through getting a pump. Um, and the insulin is the key that unlocks the cells to allow nutrients to flow in which then you also have uh, protein and insulin, or sorry, and uh, gl glucose in your blood too to push into the muscle. And then um, growth hormone, IGF-1, to uh, signal to, to do the repair process. So if you're looking to build a, you know maximal muscle with zero regard for health consequences, yeah, I would say... You should take the growth hormone pre-workout. Uh, that makes sense. Um, the thing that you're going to be um, having some bad things happen about would be, well, your heart's under a lot of stress while you're exercising, uh, more so than any other time of the day. Uh, your your heart it, the and your veins... Uh, your blood pressure during your workout, your blood pressure spikes to outrageously high levels during the middle of your set. You know, when you're pushing and your face turns all red and it feels like you, you know, your eyeballs are going to pop or something like that. <laughs> your blood pressure during those brief moments is extremely high. Um, and, uh, just the, the, uh, what you're doing to your heart, you know, you're, you're, exercising, your heart's working hard, it's being strained, you're, you're um, 
doing quick anaerobic activity that uh, your heart has to go from zero to a hundred and, and you know how it's beating you know before and after a squat set etc um, and so it's going through major workload and if you have uh, high amounts of IGF-1 or high amounts of insulin and IGF-1 growth factors uh, in your blood during that time that's not good for you uh, you, you know, talking about people like Dallas McCarver, you know, it, he's he's just a really good one to, to mention with this kind of stuff because he was doing full on abuse and, you know, they do the autopsy and, and, and also Rich Piana, you know, and the, the hearts are, you know, more than double uh, a normal human heart size. So, you know major heart growth that's not good at all to you know they're they're your organs are going to grow like as a bigger person all of your organs are going to grow as a bigger person um it happens to fat people too but you know your other uh parts of your body aren't growing with that like your skeleton and um your body is always going to be meant to be you know whatever height it was meant to be or whatever and if you you know make the body too huge you're putting a lot of strain on it putting a lot of strain on you know your on, on all your organs and all your supportive structures of your body uh if you have a lot of growth factors in your blood while you're exercising um you, you know you might get some better you're probably going to get a little bit better benefits than if you do it right afterwards um and, but if if you do it right afterwards, you get really good effects too. So rather than taking the growth hormone pre-workout and the, the insulin pre-workout, which does grow the muscle the best, yes, but not that much better than taking it after the workout, right? It, it's really not a huge difference. It's just a small difference. So if you want to take care of... Uh, your cardiovascular system best it it makes sense to take the growth hormone after your workout when your heart is not going to be under uh, an enormous amount of strain and having the insulin and igf1 uh, and growth factors at a maximum you know uh wait till after your workout and the heart's no longer going to be under a lot of stress but your muscles will have been stressed out and damaged from the workout and then take your repair hormones at that time uh, just after the workout instead. Uh, growth hormone is a recuperation and repair molecule, and uh, it makes sense to take it after your workout for that purpose. Um, that's why I, I take my growth hormone uh, post-workout. Uh, I, I like to divide it in two shots per day, but if I had to choose one shot per day to take it, you know, I like to take it morning and then post-workout. But if I had to take it um, in only one time per day, the time that I would choose would be post-workout. It's a recovery molecule. Growth hormone is for recovery. So recovering from your workout. Get done with your workout, take your growth hormone shot. All right, and the other part of the growth hormone uh, that I was getting questions about was uh, intramuscular versus subcutaneous versus intravenous injection. So intramuscular and subcutaneous injection of growth hormone both absorb about two-thirds of the dosage that you take. The other third is just destroyed in in the metabolism. Your body just metabolizes and destroys it. Uh, So, you know, you're, you're the, the bioavailability of the growth hormone through intramuscular and subcutaneous shots is about 70%. Whereas the bioavailability of growth hormone in intravenous shots, so shooting it into a vein is about 98%. So uh, per, you know, you're, if you shot the growth hormone into the vein, you're getting about 30% more effects for the same dosage. Um, the way to have the growth hormone in your blood for the longest period of time is subcutaneous injection. Um, The way to have a quick and fast high spike that's significantly higher spike, but then shorter duration, but still a reasonable duration of the growth hormone is intramuscular shot. 
uh, which makes sense for post workout. Um, subcutaneous would be would make more sense for like a starting the day uh, shot. Um, and then you know the vein, it's not recommended, but I'm not going to say people don't do it because they do, and it's also been researched uh, during the um, during the studies on on growth hormone for the the pharmaceutical growth hormones that are manufactured, the companies that produce those growth hormones uh, researched you know what happens when you do it intravenous. So intravenous injections are more risky than intramuscular or subcutaneous. Um, getting infections, uh, if you get an infection in your blood, for example, that is way more dangerous than getting an infection in your muscle, for example. So anytime that you're injecting into veins, you're risking pushing some bacterias into your bloodstream. And that has a risk of sepsis. So sepsis can kill you in like 24 hours where, you know, your blood gets a bacterial infection and uh, then the bacteria cause your heart to stop, freeze up. And so, uh, I mean, that's one risk of doing regular intravenous injections. Uh, So I wouldn't recommend at all um, doing the intravenous injections uh, for the growth hormone. Uh, but I just wanted to let you guys know that it is possible. It is. It does increase the potency of the growth hormone. And the IGF-1 spike from it is astronomically higher than either the intramuscular or subcutaneous ways. The growth hormone uh, lasts for like mm, six, about six hours or so from a, a, an injection into the fat about three or four hours from an injection into the muscle, but it only lasts 10 minutes from an injection into the vein. And that is because it's doing the whole growth hormone response thing in 10 minutes, uh, you know, compressing, uh, you know, what's happening in, you know, three or four hours from an intramuscular or six or seven hours from a, into the fat, compressing that whole thing into a 10 minute interval, uh, where a very astronomically high, IGF-1 spike happens and then uh, dissipates uh, in a very short period of time. That's uh, what happens with the the shots in the vein. So that's uh, an explanation on how that works. Been getting questions too about testosterone cream for TRT. Um, The cream works for the TRT. The cream isn't good for the bodybuilding it's not good for getting uh really big muscles and um you know be, being looking like a bodybuilder uh but as far as like a sex drive energy um normal muscle mass the way that a normal human should have the muscle mass uh it works really good uh for that you know so androgel something like that or andractin these uh it's like a lotion base testosterone that people rub on themselves. So if you're getting offered that and you don't want to be doing bodybuilding, but you do want to have normal testosterone like a regular man who, uh, you know, like the way that you should have when you were a teenager or something, um, then then yes, the cream is a good option for that. Um, and it's instantly bioavailable so there's no ester or anything like that it absorbs through your skin into your bloodstream and as soon as it absorbs through your skin into your bloodstream bam it's active so it's a bit like testosterone suspension in the way that it um, is in and out really really fast um yeah so then uh also there's been some questions about how to use provirin and uh because because it's been discussed on the podcast that provirin is extremely strong for sex drive stimulation and it is very strong for mental sex drive stimulation you know i've said before provirin is to your mind for sex drive as viagra is to your dick 
for sex drive. So Viagra doesn't make you have more sexual desire, but it really has a strong effect on your dick. Um, Proviron doesn't give you an erection, but it really has a strong effect on your brain as far as the urge for sex. And generally, if somebody is using a lot of Proviron, they're going to be masturbating a lot uh, because the urge is just going to come over them and uh, pretty much take control for a little while. You know, it's very overwhelming, the uh, mental uh, situation that happens when you're using Proviron. But it doesn't work on demand like Viagra does. People are used to using Viagra and then, uh, you know, 30 minutes later, it's working. Proviron doesn't work like that. You cannot use it on demand because of um, the way that hormones work, how they have to take time to uh, transmit their message to the nucleus of the cells and then have a different expression of the portion of your genes that they affect. Uh, Usually the male androgenic portion of your genes become more pronounced. So Proviron will not work until you have been using it for four or five, six days, uh, you will not notice effects. So you can take, you know, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams of Proviron um, as a one-off dosage, and you will not notice the effect uh, the way that you would if you took 25 milligrams of Proviron for five or six days in a row, which then you would start feeling the effects big time uh, mentally. So just a reminder uh, that Proviron or a clarification for people who are wondering, a lot of people, you know, they want to use Proviron as a, as a, they, they want to, they want to be horny at a certain time. They've, they've let me know this. They want to be horny at a certain time. And so they want to take the Proviron and the Viagra, but uh, it's not going to work like that. It, it's going to be a very disappointing experience. You have to take the Proviron um, regularly to make it work. Uh, halo test infects. Don't talk about that much on the podcast. Halo testing is an interesting one. Um, it, it's expensive and it's not worth it for what it does, but it is interesting. Out of any uh, steroid that I've used that actually affects my strength pre-workout it is the number one steroid I've used. Uh, Trenbolone can do it. Trenbolone can do it if you, you know, say you're taking um, 350 milligrams of Trenbolone per week. And now you are like, oh, I got a big lift today. Um, and it's morning and you're like, I'm going to do this lift in the afternoon. Or, you know, I'm going to do this lift, uh, uh, you know, three hours from now you can add an extra milliliter to your trend injection that day. So you're like, well, I got to take more or something. And and so you're like, I was scheduled to take a hundred milligrams, but you fill the syringe with 200 milligrams of trend acetate. And then, yeah, that can definitely make you a little bit stronger during your workout two or three hours later. Um, but uh, it's, you know, halo testing, I, I would say it's superior in that regard. I would say it's superior. It's it's a one trick pony, the the halo testing, and that this is what it does. And also the halo testing doesn't need time to build up in your body in order to get the effects, which is also very um very unusual and suggests that its effects are primarily outside of the male hormone receptors. And it's it that's is suggestive that the effects are not working on the nucleus of your cell, but are working through some other effect on your body. Um, uh, Cholinergic receptor um, stimulation is definitely a possibility here because uh, the, the molecular structure of the halotestin that makes it unique is the halogenated um, carbon bond on the molecule that most other steroids do not have. Um, and that affects um, cholinergic uh, receptors, which it's a type of receptor that also uh, affects muscle growth and athletic performance in addition to androgen receptors. And 
but it, it it's not traditionally studied or it hasn't been studied much um it, it's also theorized to be the cholinergic receptor to be one of the reasons why testosterone works really good um better than almost all other steroids in a a non uh dosage linear amount like you could just keep taking more and more and more and it keeps on working better and better and better um Anyways, don't want to get too sidetracked on that. Anyways, the, the, the halo testin works on a one-off dosage. You can take it, and you will literally be 5, 10, 15 pounds stronger during your workout to about two hours later, um, able to push that much more weight on your normal working sets. And really having a good desire to really uh hit the weights hard really ready to really um go through an intense workout the the halo testin can be used at about mm, 30 40 50 milligrams pre-workout in that manner for that effect and that's pretty much all the halo testin does it doesn't grow your muscles and uh, if you take it consistently, you will not notice muscle gains and um, or anything else, really. It, 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 it doesn't have any estrogen effects, which is nice. So it doesn't spike your estrogen or something the way D-Ball does. But, uh, yeah, it's a one-trick pony. You want to use Halo Testin, uh, you can use it pre-workout. And it will actually give some strength gains. Um, unlike testosterone suspension, which a lot of people think testosterone suspension is going to give them strength gains if they take that before their workout, but it doesn't. It helps you get a good pump and it helps you have like a good mental state for working out. It makes you hornier. It gives you an enormous estrogen spike and a lot of water retention, testosterone suspension, but uh, does not make you stronger uh, pre-workout. Uh, Halo testing does make you stronger pre-workout and does not have those uh, female hormone effects. Um, as far as my favorite type of testosterone goes, uh, I have become a huge fan of Sustanon. Uh, only quality made Sustanon. I, I used to always use testosterone and anthate for years, for years, but um, I've been in Eastern Europe uh, for the past year now. And here, uh, Sustanon is what is available in the pharmacies. So it's, it's pharmaceutical, human-grade Sustanon. And before, I'd always had problems with Sustanon. When I'd use it, I'd have a lot of test flu, have a lot of inflammation. It was uh, UGL, Sustanon. And uh, I'd have a lot of mood swings, ups and downs, uh, a lot of problems with it, and did not like Sustanon. I specifically did not like it. Uh, but now that I've been using the pharmaceutical grade Sustanon, um, Jelfa Omnidrin, uh, Aspen um, Sustanon 250, and also Originon Sustanon 250, um, but predominantly I've been using Jelfa Omnidrin um, Sustanon ampules. And uh, it's my favorite testosterone that I've ever used by far. So... Each milliliter of the Sustanon 250 has 90 milligrams of propionate in it, uh, 30 milligrams of uh, phenylpropionate, 60 milligrams of normal propionate, which is fast-acting testosterone. So, you know, you take a shot, and that's almost like taking a 100-milligram shot of uh, testosterone propionate. And then you have the, the longer-acting acting esters, the isocaproate and uh, caproate esters, coming in the next day that, that are similar to like an enanthate sipionate. And so you, you feel a really large boost, a mental effect from the propionate. And then, you know, on the first day, and then you feel it again on the second day. Um, and then the third day is about uh, the same, same normal. And then, you know, by about the fourth or fifth day again, you want to take another shot. You don't want to go like a week without taking a shot on uh, Sustanon, you'll, you'll feel like eh, it's, it's going down now. Uh, but I enjoy the mental effects of peaking blood levels of testosterone. Uh, it, it's stimulating. I like the mood it puts me in. I like the way it makes me feel. 
and I don't like taking uh, steroid injections every day. I'm over it. I hate doing that. It hurts. Uh, putting these metal poles in me all the time, and uh, it's a pain in my ass. And I've I've done it a lot, and um, you know at this point I don't want to do it. So normally these days what I do when I take a steroid injection is I use a five milliliter syringe because I just want to get as much jammed in there in one shot as possible and, um, you know, not take another injection for a little while. Um, anyways, I like the sustenon. I don't want to use propionate. I don't want to be injecting every day. I don't like doing that. Uh, although I go through phases where I do do it. Um, but with the sustenon, I can get 250 milligrams of testosterone into me and get 90 milligrams of propionate into me uh, as part of that 250 at the same time, uh, you know, taking the, the milliliter of sustenon. So sustenon's great as long as it's made really high quality. It's four different esters of testosterone that all have different boiling points. And so it's difficult for UGLs to make. So usually the UGLs make a very shitty, um, painful, inflammatory sustenon. Don't like that. Only like pharmaceutical grade cystin on. Normally, we talk about on the podcast eating whole foods, eating meats, eating uh, chicken, uh, beef, uh, pork a lot. And normally that's the basis of my diet. But normally, I've, I, or recently, I, I got a bit sick of eating meat and needed a, a break from putting so many... Uh, kilograms of meat into me per day. I was eating about two kilograms of meat per day, you know, from, you know, that's normally what I do. Uh, so something like four pounds of meat or so per day, three, 400 milligrams, you know, three or four pounds, three or 400 milligrams of, uh, meat, uh, per day, protein per day. Um, but it, it can get old, and um, also the digestion. It can cause digestion issues. Been taking a break personally uh, and eating egg whites and fish instead, which has been nice. It's been much easier to digest and it's been nice to not have to chew so much. Uh, I really like the egg whites with the, the Chinese red sweet and sour sauce. Uh, and then I've, I've been eating fish uh, smoked salmon and, uh, cooked salmon, a lot of that, uh, and also a white fish from a can and pouring soy sauce on it. Uh, been my main protein sources with a little bit of whey protein, usually about 25 milligrams of whey protein a day, sorry, 25 grams of whey protein per day. So, you know, just one scoop along with the, uh, egg whites and fish. It's been a great, great little break from the meat. You know, I'll be back on the, the regular meat again uh, very soon here, but needed a little break. Egg whites and fish worked good. Somebody asked me recently, what's the most underrated performance enhancing drug? And uh, metformin without a doubt. Uh, you, you know, it, people hate on metformin so much because they just cannot get over the research that they read online. Okay. So scientists don't know everything. Okay. Um, they only know what they know, okay? And what they don't know, they don't know. So when they say there's no evidence for that, that means we haven't done experiments that have made us know that that happens yet. So they're not God. They don't know everything. They're not all knowing. They only know some things, okay? Scientists. They only know some things. They don't know everything. They know some things because not all science had been discovered yet. That's why we're still making discoveries. That's why we made progress because they don't know everything yet. They're not gods. So when they say there's no evidence for that, that means they don't know that yet because they haven't discovered that yet. So they know what they know and they don't know anything else. They don't know shit. They don't know fuck. So when you have uh, scientists come out with this information about metformin, about what they do know, and... Um, they they say something about IGF-1, which which is that people just cannot get over this, that they say something about IGF-1 or mTOR and AMP-K energy systems. Uh, okay, so, you know, just suck it. 
Suck it, okay? It, these people that can't get over that, you, you know, shut the fuck up. Shut the... F- okay. There's more to it. There's more to it than you know. There's more to it than you know. There are things happening here other than what science knows that's happening. And um, if you don't want to take it, then just don't take it. If you do want to take it, then you're going to get a lot bigger and you're going to get a lot harder. You're going to get a lot more 3D. You're going to have your muscles more bursting against your skin. They're going to look like big, hard blocks um, that look the way um, when you just wake up in the morning that they did before when you had your biggest pump in the gym. You're just going to look like that all the time instead once you're taking 2,000 milligrams of metformin per day. Um, That's what happens when you use it. So you can talk about all the science you want and talk about why... It is blah, 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 and all, all, your, all your bullshit. Uh, but that's what happens when you take metformin. So you get a lot bigger all the time and a lot more 3D and full and blocky looking. Um, that's, that's what happens. Uh, combine 2,000 milligrams of metformin per day with any dosage of pharmaceutical-grade growth hormone. And that's what happens. Um, so that's the most underrated PED. It uh, has an enormous effect on your appearance. Um, all right, let's get on to some questions here. Question from you can't, you, you can, can. This was a really flattering question. So I, I, I had to put it on. I, I liked this one. I've listened to every episode twice now and about to go for three. This podcast and your book, The Ultimate Guide to Roids, are the best bodybuilding tools on the planet. Thanks for everything you do. I have a question for the show. I just started pinning two months ago. I only have two injection sites so far, left and right glutes. I'll add hips soon. I have to work up the courage every time I do anything new with needles. <laughs> well, he's new. He's new. He's, it's two months ago, you know. That's the thing with taking injections if you're not used to it, you know. There's an unknown factor. Especially the first time before you've ever taken an injection before. You've never penetrated your body with anything before, hopefully. And, you know, you are going to stick a metal pole inside of you. Yeah, a very small metal pole inside of you. Um, So, you know, you're like, well, I don't even know what the fuck is in there. All you've ever seen is your skin. Uh, And and so, you you know, you're going to put a metal pole in there and it's very psychologically disturbing uh, crossing that barrier for the first time. So I understand what you mean. Working up the courage as a new steroid user to do anything new with needles. The question is, how do you know when you have scar tissue? Can you feel it with your fingers or does it feel when you use the muscle like a bruise? My injection today didn't slide in as easily. Is that because of scar tissue? Thanks again. Bro, I'm 48 years old and I've wanted to be big my whole life because of you. I finally know how. Aww. Um, yeah, the, what you were talking about with it not sliding in as easily, that could be a, a sign of scar tissue or inflammation in the injection site, but also of you flexing, slightly flexing uh, when you're doing the injection. Scar tissue will start... Uh, causing joint problems after a while as the scar tissue makes the muscle less flexible and then the less flexible muscle is then applying pressure to the tendon which is putting the joint slightly out of position and you'll have pain uh, joint pain muscle pain um, and you'll, you'll need to get rid of the scar tissue by applying extreme pressure to it with a a hard ball like a croquet ball or some kind of therapeutic pole like a a theracane um, or foam rolling, some kind of deep tissue uh, therapy like that in order to to break up the scar tissue. But yeah, it's hard to the touch. So scar tissue from injections is, is hard to the touch. You can touch it and you go... It's not soft and pliable like the muscle around it. It's hard. It feels like armor. Um, it's not flexible and pliable. It's, it's hard. And yes, like you said, it's harder to 
put the needle through it, and you'll notice kind of like breaking through that area actually as you put the needle in deep enough. Pretty interesting. Um, scar tissue is more likely to happen if you do not take deep injections. So people that are using the insulin syringes with the half inch needle, uh, you know, which is easy to take an injection that way, but it generally causes a lot more scar tissue to build up using those um, shallow needles. Uh, again, the the deeper the injection is, you know, one inch, 1.5 inches deep. Um, I like one inch. Uh, it, it's definitely less scar tissue producing than these really shallow injections, like half inch deep, or sometimes people even do less. Those usually cause a lot more uh, scar tissue. Um, also, also though, UGL gear causes more scar tissue because of the chemicals in it. Um, just in general, especially, it, you know, it depends on the quality of your UGL gear. But, you know, how much sterilants in it. Sterilants are very irritating. That's usually what causes a lot of post-injection pain and inflammation, too. You know, you got a pharmaceutical-grade company. They don't need to use as much sterilants to prevent infections as a UGL does. The pharmaceutical grade company has a very clean, clean production facility with uh, clean rooms and you know no bacteria in there. The UGL doesn't have access to that. So they gotta put more chemicals inside to sterilize it to make sure you don't get an infection. So one of the reasons why UGLs generally have way more post-injection pain than, uh, and soreness and inflammation than uh, a pharmaceutical does. Matt asks, what's up, Dan? Love the podcast. Discovered it a few weeks ago. Been listening daily since. I have a question. I'm a month and a half in on a cycle of tessipionate, uh, T-ball, and super draw two weeks ago and have noticed swelling, water retention on my lower legs and ankles. Is this an estrogen issue? Kidneys? Been taking a Remedex once a week. Not sure if that could address the issue. Um, yeah, you probably need, you know, you're taking Equipoise 700 and testosterone 550 a week. You should probably experiment with taking more than 100 milligrams, sorry, more than one milligram of Rumidex per week, maybe two milligrams of Rumidex per week to deal with that and see if it goes away. Other thing that I think of right immediately is are you tall? Because tall, heavy people experience a lot of water retention in their feet and ankles. So fat people who are tall, uh, but also bodybuilders who are tall. It's, this is a thing uh, where if they're over six foot one or so, over six foot two, six foot three, they, from, they, they get water retention and swelling down in their ankles and feet. It's, it's a thing. So that's another question I have for you. And then the, the third one would be, some people don't respond to super draw well. It is a very individually uh, responding hormone. Some people get very sick on it very fast, uh, two or three weeks on it, and they're really not feeling good and having problems um, and toxicity problems. But other guys can use it for months and uh, you know not have problems. Uh, I don't have problems on super draw. I, I, you know what? I've used Superdraw for 10, 12 weeks without stopping before. Woo, the internet says I should be dead. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. Okay, so that's uh, me. I'm not sensitive to it in that way, but I know many people who are sensitive to it in that way. Okay, um, so it may, it may just not be for you. Superdraw may not be for you. Testosterone Truth asks, Dan, love the podcast and the book. This is a bit winded, so I'll put the question right up front. What is your specific understanding of post-injection cough, PIC? I call it PIC because most of us know from experience that Trenbolone is not at all the only drug which can cause this nightmare effect. Personally, I've gotten some level of cough from every drug in the AAS collection of beauties, except water-based products, which caused me to wonder recently if anyone else can recall ever getting PIC, post-injection cough, from Winnie or test suspension injections. 
Uh, I don't think that I ever have gotten any cough from uh, testosterone suspension or Winstrel injections. I don't get cough um, on a regular basis at all from any steroids except for Primobolin and uh, Trenbolone. But I have had cough from testosterone and Masteron uh, as well. Um, with Primobolin, it's more of an itchiness and that's pretty common. Pretty common to notice an itchiness in my throat. Uh, Trenbolone can be, you know, really bad. Where, uh, again, it's it's not going to kill you for you guys that are like scared of Tren cough or whatever. It's very uncomfortable, is what I mean by you know pretty bad. Uh, you'll never die. Don't worry. But it will be. It can be very uncomfortable uh, because it can really make your face red and cause you to cough really hard and kind of need to lay down on the floor and until the coughing allergic response stops pretty debilitating um and then maybe feel kind of fucked up for like two hours afterwards or something um but it can happen with any injectable and and primarily what's happening is you're getting a rapid introduction of something into your bloodstream the the trend cough is the worst when you bleed after the injection. If blood comes out after you've taken a tread injection, your chances of trend cough are way higher than if you don't bleed when you pull the needle out. And that's because when you bleed, that's because you pass through a vein and, and opened up a very immediate uh, introduction of the trend balloon into your blood, which the trend balloon definitely has a specific effect um, with the cough where the actual trend balloon molecule uh, causes an allergic reaction um, that it causes an allergy uh, when, as that uh, passes into your vein at a high concentration and uh, then through its expel, there's some expellation of uh, chemicals, um, trenbolone happening through your, your heart and lungs because when stuff goes into your vein, within seconds, it goes through your heart and uh, then is breathed in the oxygen exchange out your lungs. That's what's happening with trend cough and allergic reaction. There's also, um, you know, less, less uh, irritating uh, compounds that can cause this in other steroids. Uh, just the, the, the hormone itself being introduced at a very high concentration uh, when it meets the bloodstream through uh, like a, a, a torn vein, uh, but also the, the oil, the oil being introduced into the bloodstream, that the carrier oil of the steroid and also the um, dilutant product that's in it and the sterilant alcohol product that's in it all can be then you know, goes to your heart and there's an oxygen exchange between your, your lungs and your heart. Uh, and then it becomes expelled out your, out your lungs, which is very uncomfortable. So it can happen with anything. Primobolin causes itchiness regularly. Trenbolone causes a cough. Trenbolone acetate causes a hard cough frequently. Uh, not really something you can avoid very well. Okay. Uh, Next question is from Brad. Hey, Dan, kind of a different question from the norm. I'm 23 and naturally had a very high sex drive. Been taking PEDs for over a year now and have an unhealthily high sex drive. Uh, usually felt the most when on high dosages of testosterone. Currently taking 500 milligrams of Sustanon, 250 a week, 300 milligrams Deco a week, 50 milligrams Winstrol a day and one milligram of Rimidex twice per week. I heard all these questions about raising libido, but do you know of any ways of lowering it? I just want to feel a normal sex drive. I currently feel like a masturbating freak, like you reference in the podcast. Yeah, good idea taking DECA. That, that's one way that you can kind of limit your sex drive. Don't take any cabergolin with your DECA because... If you do, then it will eliminate the anti-sex drive effects of the DECA. You should 
I think it's good too that you're keeping the testosterone at 500 milligrams, uh, but you're using sustenon, which is fast acting testosterone, which has a way, what well, has fast acting testosterone in it, which has a way more potent mental effect than normal testosterone. Something like testosterone undec- undecanoate, very slow acting, or even just test E, test C, is going to have less of a mental effect on you. Keep going with the DECA, maybe increase the DECA, actually. Um, yeah, you know, some, some people just have, a, they have a really extreme reaction to testosterone with the sex drive. Most people get their best sex drive on uh, 250 to 500 milligrams of testosterone a week. Uh, you know, they expect like, oh, if I took a thousand, it'll just keep going up. But that's not the way it is in reality. Um, but I, I've met other guys that have really in, insane sex drive too from just taking any injectable test. Makes them have like a hard time like being faithful in relationships too, which is, you know, pretty out of control. Um, you know, it seems to just be an individual side effect <laughs> that you've got to deal with. Um, I think you're, you're heading in the right direction, you know, taking DECA and, and don't take Cabergol in it. Because if, if you do get your prolactin high, which should happen at a certain level of taking the DECA uh, without Cabergol, and it will directly counteract your sex drive because the prolactin is the hormone that is released in your brain after you orgasm that makes your erection go down. Um, That makes you lose interest in sex. So if you can get that up high enough using uh, enough DECA without Cabergol, uh, you should be able to reduce uh, your sex drive. So you're on the right track. If I were you, I would keep doing what you're doing, but just keep titrating up the DECA dose and and try to hit a point where your uh, sex drive uh, is tempered a bit. All right. All right. And uh, the last question for today is from Nikolai. Hey, Dan, love the podcast. Hope all is well. Currently training for my first show this September. Seven weeks on my cycle, which is test D, 350, equipoise, 350, 25 milligrams deep all a day. I uh, don't need any AI since I don't aromatize very much at all. My coach had me get some HGH, and I was able to get pharmaceutical grade serostim 126 IU kit, 7 vials, 18 IUs per vial. This is the one that is made for people with AIDS. They're supposed to take 18 IU vial uh, once per day. And so the 126 IU kit, 7 vials, is meant for one week of growth hormone use. Uh, that's the, this is the standard uh, type of growth hormone that is prescribed for AIDS patients. Uh, it came with dilutant, not bacteriostatic water. So it just came with sterile water. Um, and my coach just had me start taking two IUs Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If I store this in the fridge, will it last the three weeks it takes me to use each vial or should I just increase the amount I take to use it up within two weeks? The packet says with dilutant to discard after 24 hours, but I'm using clean techniques. So I'm not worried about growing bacteria inside. What are your thoughts? Also bumping up tests and equipoise, both the 700 this week. And I'm excited about that. Yeah. So what they're doing is, is they want the AIDS patient that this is prescribed to, to take the entire vial of growth hormone once per day. And they're only providing the, uh, the person with uh, sterile water um, instead of bacteriostatic water specifically to uh, decrease the shelf life of the growth hormone to try to enforce them, you know, taking uh, the growth, the whole vial, you know, every day, or else throw it away. One reason for this is because they want uh, they want to make money. They want to get the AIDS patient a lot of IUs of growth hormone, and then um, you know they say throw it away after 24 hours. It's still good after 24 hours, okay? But uh, you, you know it does start degrading af- after about mm, five days, seven days. Uh, maximum 14 days, uh, but more, more like three to five days, honestly, in the uh, sterile water. You want to use that stuff fast because uh, uh, there, there's bacteria in everything, man. 
as soon as soon as you you break that vacuum seal um and and put anything into the growth hormone vial there there's a little bit of bacteria in there so even if you do have it in the fridge it's still growing not bacteria that's going to give you an infection um yeah, i mean you have bacteria all over your skin but bacteria living all over in your body you know it's not an amount that is going to be it's not a threshold amount that's going to give you an infection but uh it is growing and the bacteria actually eats the growth hormone the, the growth hormone is amino acid proteins and the bacteria eat it as fuel to survive. And so that's why the growth hormone becomes less potent and why people put bacteriostatic water in their growth hormone, which has a, a bit of alcohol in it uh, that makes it so that the, the bacteria have a much harder time surviving in the aqueous watery solution with the growth hormone. But the sterile water uh, is normally sodium chloride solution and does not have the alcohol, uh, sterilant antibacterial qualities. And so uh, the bacteria are able to consume the growth hormone much quicker. Uh, so when the, the 18 I use uh, per vial and then them saying, you know, to throw away the vial if you don't use it all after 24 hours, it mostly has to do with uh, the potency of the product. Um, however, it's still going to maintain its full potency for three to five days after you reconstitute the vial. I would recommend obtaining bacteriostatic water and to use that with your growth hormone instead of the um, sterile water that came supplied with the serostim. If you want to be, uh, you know, using less than six IUs per day of the serostim because if it was me i don't i don't like messing around with it i don't i don't like messing around with with growth hormone i'm i'm very careful with growth hormone that i use um with making sure that it's fully potent and not degraded um always cold um and and when i have used stuff like um uh gin tropin in the russian box which is very similarly packaged the way sero stim is you know, I, I definitely use bacteriostatic water or if I use the stuff that it comes with, which is sodium chloride solution, then I've made sure to, you know, use it all up in three days, uh, not to leave it um, or four days, not to leave it in there, uh, degrade, giving any chance possible to degrade growth hormone, fragile stuff. Yeah, I just if I was you, I, I would you can continue doing the two I use Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but. I would, I would just buy separately bacteriostatic water and uh, use that with the growth hormone. Use your own bacteriostatic water. Discard the sterile water that came with the serostim. And uh, it, the bacteriostatic water will not, that you buy separately, will not damage the serostim. Uh, it'll just make it be able to last in the refrigerator without degrading for three to four weeks. So... The growth hormone lasts with the bacteriostatic water without losing potency for three to four weeks. Uh, with the uh, sterile water, sodium chloride solution for three to five days. Okay, so it extends the shelf life. If you guys want to get on the phone with me, uh, hit me up. Uh, Steroids podcast at gmail.com. It's $59 for an hour. Ask me any questions about your bodybuilding, training, diet, steroids, cycles, side effects. Any help you need. Uh, same thing with the, the WhatsApp texting. You can text me, message me every day. Um, as many messages as you need. Um, on, on the WhatsApp. Uh, questions about bodybuilding, training, diet, steroids. Uh, your cycle, etc. Troubleshooting side effects. Anything uh, that you need. I'm there for you. Bodybuilding related. Uh, you can send me as many messages as you need to every day, um, and I'll always get back to you. Get back to all your messages within 24 hours or less. That's $99 for a month. That's the WhatsApp text messaging uh, program with me for the, the steroids podcast. Um, yeah, so if you want to do one of those, send me an me email at steroidspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, Got to make them gains. Ultimate guide to roids. The official steroids podcast. See you guys next time. If you would like your questions to be answered on the steroids podcast, go to 
steroidspodcast.com and leave a comment with your questions or email or private message steroidspodcast at gmail.com or steroidspodcast on Instagram. Until next time.